buddies. It's concert buddy. So excited for you to join me for this latest episode on Vinyl Community Podcasts. It's a conversation that in some respects to me, it's almost been 20 years in the making. From the first time I saw my guest and his band Silvertide open up for Velvet Revolver. Remember them? You had Scott Weiland from Stone Temple Pilots on vocals. You had Slash, Duff McKagan, and Matt Sorum from Guns N' Roses filling out the rest of the band. Super group, rock super group. Well, this band that opened for him, Silvertide, blew me away. And I've been following the musicians involved in that band ever since through social media and so forth. So I'm talking to the guitar player from Silvertide today, and that's Nick Perry. Nick's current project is Nick Perry and the Underground Thieves, who have a new album coming out on June 16th called Terra Firma. It's on double vinyl. Yes, we'll get into that in a little bit. But Nick was kind enough to share an advance of a new album with me in advance of our conversation, and in a word, it's awesome. If you like Pink Floyd or Neil Young or stories or themes behind the music you listen to, I think you'll really enjoy it. In addition to some killer rock songs, great guitar work, good songs. I mean, anything and everything you'd want in a good album, Terra Firma has it. So we'll talk about Terra Firma. We'll talk about the album before Terra Firma from Nick Perry and the Underground Thieves at Sun Via. It's over my shoulder there. Both of those albums are unique in the sense that they're self-financed self-written, self-produced, self-promoted. See, the band does not have the backing of a traditional label, which is really interesting to me, and I think it speaks to Nick's entrepreneurial spirit. We get into that in the conversation. We also get into Nick's passion and enjoyment of vinyl, which of course is a prerequisite to be on Vinyl Community Podcast, right? He even shows some of the records he recently picked up. Really exciting, you can see a smile on his face. You just know that his enthusiasm for the format is right where it needs to be (laughs) to be a vinyl community podcast so we kind of geeked out for a little bit talking records and it was a lot of fun but anyway it's a really interesting conversation to go back to that first time i saw silver tide 20 years ago to present day terra firma and the fact that vinyl community podcasts is evolving to talk to folks outside the vinyl community directly i think it's a good thing and hopefully you do too so Buckle up, buddies. I think it's a great conversation. You're in for a great treat. Let's get into it now. And you thought vinyl left. You're listening to the Vinyl Community Podcasts. Everything vinyl. Big day here on Vinyl Community Podcast. I'm joined by Nick Perry. Nick, how's it going? Wonderful. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It, uh, it's 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 really ironic because when I was doing some some a little homework for this this talk, it dawned on me. I think first time I saw you perform was, I hate to say it, almost 20 years ago. We're, oh we're my getting, god! We're getting long in the tooth, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but no, Nick is a musician I followed since I saw him almost 20 years ago, and his career has taken some interesting travels along the way but uh an exciting development is he has a new album coming out with nick perry and the underground thieves called terra firma coming out on june 16th uh, nick was kind enough to let me preview some of it so i'm really excited to kind of ask him about it because i've listened to it when i'm running i've listened to it when i'm cutting the grass i've listened to it in the car and so i've just really been absorbing it and it finally hit me on a run run this morning that it's Life and death, like literally, <laughs> like literally, the sequence of songs hit me, and I was like, I think this the the title track is a pivot point. So anyway, we'll get into all that kind of stuff. But um, so let's hit it. before we go forward. Let's go back a little bit. First band I got to know you from was Silvertide, and again, going back to that almost twenty years ago kind of piece, um, you guys were opening for Velvet Revolver, who came through St. Louis. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that, well, I know that that was a mega show. That was the very first show. It was the first of, show. Yes, thank you. It was the first show of that tour. And for people who don't know the story of what that tour was, so when Velvet Revolver, who got signed to our label by Clive Davis at the time, J Records, um, mm-hmm. basically before they went out on this huge arena tour, which they did very shortly thereafter, they decided to do a warm up tour 
which is like all these cool theaters. And to me, and I'm sure people out there who are listening um, and watching know that like, you know, if you have the opportunity to go to one of these old, like historic theaters, like they're just the coolest places to see shows. For me as a performer, they're my favorite venues because they just, they have an energy. It's like, um, it's bigger and more exciting and feels like more of a production than a club, but it's as big as you can get and still feel intimate that it's not like an arena where you're like, they just look like tiny little dots. You know what I mean? So I, I, the club or the, the theater run is like my all time favorite. And truth be told, if I could play theaters for the rest of my life, like I'd be totally stoked. That would, it's just a perfect venue for me. But anyway, so we were very fortunate. We got the entire run of shows. I think it was like 12 shows that we did with Velvet Revolver. They were all the warm up tour um, for the arena tour that came after. And um, that was the very first night of the tour. And mm-hmm. it was just uh, a magical time. It was a magical time in my life in the band's run. You know, we had a short but mighty run. And um, that show was off the hook. I mean, all those shows were, but I remember that night specifically as being just like, a memorable night no it, it, it and it was memorable for me because you know i was a big stone temple guy and then obviously i heard about you know the super group getting put together with wylan on vocals and the guns and roses guys and you know i was like what is this and it's coming to st louis and it's the first night of this like exactly what you said it was like the warm-up tour and wylan even said that on stage he's like enjoy it now because we're not playing places this small ever again right and so we go to the show, we're excited, we came, and there's this opening band called Silver Tide. And I'm like, okay, so I'm getting my beer, and I'm settling in, and I mean, no hyperbole, blew my socks off. I was like, who are these guys? You know, like when you go to a show, and, and you know, sometimes openers, it's okay, but man, on that rare occasion, that magic hits, and you're like, who are these guys? And, you know, it was you, and Walt, and Brian, and all those guys, and it was unbelievable like i went and got the ep i got nice i got the ep and then you know i was like man so like and, and it was before i mean the internet was around so you could kind of learn but it's not as pervasive now right so i'm like who are these I mean, we, we, we were in dial-up days for people out there. <laughs> right. okay because i remember going to the hotel rooms and our tour manager was this legendary guy uh, named night bob and um we would get to the hotel and like he would bust out a, he was the only one of us who had a laptop and we're like we were excited even just to see somebody with a laptop and we, he'd like take the phone cord from the wall, you know? Yeah. And it would, <laughs> and it would be, it'd be like this thing. Like we just all hang out in his room, you know, take a hit of pot or whatever and just like wait for it to connect if it did, because sometimes it didn't and you were mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere and sometimes there would be connection issues. And, and it was just like, it was such like a crazy time in the world to even think that I was trying to explain this to my daughter uh, <laughs> who has, and will never know from this, but I was That's like, right, once upon trouble. a time, like y- you could not, you couldn't get online if you wanted to. Sometimes you just could. And sometimes you couldn't. And when you could, it was like a long thing. And it sounded yeah. like a gremlin coming out of the friggin' wall. <laughs> and, um, and it was just, you know, those, that was like the wild west. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, so that was like 2004. So then you guys came back through 2005 for like like a smaller kind of club gig. So I caught you there, uh, Mississippi Nights, which is now a closed club in St. Louis. It, it saw a lot of bands. I had I, there's a book about Mississippi Nights. So I actually found the ticket stub. It was uh, July 12, 2005, and wow. it was great because I got to see you guys. Like I think Show and Tell. I don't know if it come out yet, but you guys were able to do a full set as opposed to the opening spot for for sure. Walmer, but. Um, again, reinforced I was like, man, these guys are amazing. And you guys hung out afterwards and it was cool to talk to you. But, um, so then the silver tide, you, you reached the highest of highs. You're opening for Van Halen, Aerosmith, uh, Motley Crue was Motley Crue part of the equation. I mean, yeah, all kinds we, of bands. we did the reunion. We did both reunion tours, Van Halen reunion tour, 2004. Uh, that was with Sammy. That was an absolutely wild time. And then we did the, motley crew reunion tour called the very first time that they reunited post their 90s breakup mm. and that was in 2005 with all original mem- members of that band and that was insane i oh. mean it wasn't it wasn't like the excess of the 80s but it was it was a party <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine what what's that like, you know, kind of breaking that fourth wall for like people you're listening to and and, and, in some respects emulating your style and all that stuff to now you're literally hanging with them backstage or your professionals together. What's that like crossing that line? 
It's wild. You know, I think it's, it's more of a head trip to think about it than it is in reality because mm-hmm. it's like you get into a room with somebody and you're just like, Oh yeah. Like he's just a dude, you know, like with Eddie Van Halen, it was, it was the weirdest because I mean, he was someone that, so I had, um, it's funny. I was just talking about this again, going back to like olden times, but, uh, there was a blockbuster video that was near oh. my house growing up. Awesome. And uh, I was trying to explain to my daughter as well that Netflix, like you could not just watch what you wanted to watch when you yeah, wanted right. to watch it. Like Apple TV, like she she is so spoiled compared <laughs> to what we had. So yeah. what we were allowed to do was once a week on a Friday, if we did good in school and like we didn't get in trouble or anything, or like my mom would take us to Blockbuster and we could pick pick out like I could pick out one thing and my sister could pick out one thing. That would mean like a video game or a movie, but not one of each. Like you oh. had to choose. And, um, and so eventually, like when I started getting into music, I was, I'm really lucky because this like helped change my life that that particular blockbuster, whoever was like curating that particular one, they had a wall and the, and the, so they must, the guy must've been into music nice. or girl because there was a, a bona fide section. It wasn't just like a few things off to the side. There was a bona fide like music documentary and concert film section which for me was life changing because mm-hmm. I got to rent and watch Song Remains the Same, Zeppelin, Let There Be Rock, ACDC, like all these formative things. And one of them was Live Without a Net, which was the first tour with Sammy in 86, which but they did from New Haven, Connecticut, that they mm-hmm. renamed New Halen. <laughs> and that, that tape, I mean, all those tapes I mentioned, I, I wore holes in, like literally holes in. Um, so what I ended up doing uh, I ended up like duping the tape, like with two VCRs so that I could watch it. And that's how I learned how to play guitar. You know what I mean? Like there was a reason for this. And and I had, I had CDs and I had vinyl and all that stuff. But like, it, I, I was able to like see what these guys were doing and, huh. and be able to help figure out how to learn this stuff. Emulate, you know? sure. Yeah. So at the Van Halen one, I must have watched like, you know, 5,000 times and, <laughs> and then to like be in a room a locker room basically with Eddie backstage because although all the backstages of these huge arenas were locked like a sports team's yep. locker room. So it's like our dressing room was like bigger than the biggest club we'd ever played at that point. Mm. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's yeah, insane. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm, I'm backstage just playing guitar with Ed and just like, he's just a guy. Like we're just hanging out and talking about music and playing ACDC guitar. ACDC and, and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So his favorite band, I mean, it, it was very well publicized that, Clapton was his all-time favorite guitarist, but his favorite band was ACDC. And I was shocked. He knew all the stuff. And I, we really bonded, him and I, because he asked me what my favorite record was. And I said, Power Age. And that was his personal favorite as well. Down Payment Blues and uh, Kicked in the Teeth Again and like all those great Bon Scott songs. Mm. And um, we really bonded over it. And um, yeah, it was a magical time, man. It was just a magical time. I often look back and just like, it feels like a dream, you know, but I have pictures. So like, <laughs> I know it's real, but it right, just right. feels, it feels wild. No, it's awesome. Uh, so then, so silver tide kind of runs its course and you kind of are into the machine of the music business. Right. And so you, 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 you go here, go there. And then the next time that uh, I, I caught you, or at least you're back on my radar was you were doing uh, Sinai with your, I think Walt was involved, Walt laughing from silver tide and it was a three, I'm pretty sure it was a three piece, right? So you put out some some demos on that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, after Silver Tide, I moved to LA and tried to just find my way, which, so I tried the hired gun thing for a little while and I did a bunch of gigs with the people, really the best was with Perry Farrell, who I grew up with, with Jane's Addiction. And I was able to spend a year on tour with him, which was super fun and got to play all those legendary songs, Ben Caught Stealing and Jane Says awesome. and all that stuff. and. Um, but ultimately like as, as exciting as that was the whole time I'd be lying if I said I was like a hundred percent comfortable because it just always felt like, okay, it was cool. I'm playing his songs and it was an honor to play those songs. But like I started playing music and writing songs as a kid. So Mm -hmm. like I wanted to ideally play my own songs, you know? So I was always trying to figure out a way to kind of get back to that. So eventually I moved back to Philly started another band with Walt. It was really hard to get it off the ground. It was a, it was a trio. Um, we did a bunch of demos that I later kind of put on a disc. It's not even on the internet right now because 
one of my later in life plans is that I'm going to revisit that stuff and mix it properly yes. and like actually put it on the internet because the songs were really good. Oh, they were. They were. My, it's funny. Uh, so I, a couple months ago, my son and I took a road trip and I pulled out the, the Wayback Machine. I'm like, you got to hear these guys. So I played a little Silver Tide and I said, and I said, listen to this. And I played some Sinai stuff and he's like getting into it, getting into it because he's learning to play guitar and stuff. And, and I was like, Dude, Nick Perry, you get, this guy is an unbelievable guitar player. I mean, this is so awesome. Well, thank you, man. I, I, I appreciate that greatly. I'm very proud of the music and I'm proud of the songs. Unfortunately, I just couldn't get the band to kind of catch any traction at that moment in time. Uh, Philly, the music scene was changing and we were doing something that was like a little bit more alternative rock. And it was sure. just like it wasn't the right time. Although, like, not long after that, I feel like that style that we were really um, getting off on and, and kind of developing, I feel like it did kind of catch hold. But by that time, I was already moved on. You know what I mean? we, we had, yeah. So that's when I then moved back to California and opened up the shop. Um, because at that point in the story, it had been like, I don't know how many years, but I've been met almost to 12, about a, about a dozen years that I was like only focused on, you know, music every single day as it, as it should be. But I was sure. feeling like, man, I need to just uh, take a breath. And when I was doing the shop, I was still doing sessions. I was still writing and I was still doing music, but it was like, I pressed pause on the, I have to make a living from music and go tour and like be immersed in it, submersed in it 100%. I needed a breath from that, that like trying to make it thing. You know what I mean? Cause it's, yeah, for sure. it's, um, I don't know what to say about it. It's like, uh, it can be all consuming, you know? Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so anyway, for people who don't know, I opened up a shop with my wife in LA on Melrose Avenue. It was a cool ass place. It's called Perry and Cartel. And uh, it, it was just like I, a dream I had of like putting everything that I loved under one roof. So it was a tattoo shop, piercing, it was a barber shop, it was a guitar shop. We had a, a real life, like act, like a real motorcycle garage in the back that worked on bikes. We had bike parts and clothes. And it was just like this conglomeration of like, you know, the best of what I thought were like, um, you know, artists my age who were all in LA and like doing sure. a thing and friends that I'd met over the years. And um, it was a cool idea, man. And it's funny that like, I'll still meet people. And I went to a shop a couple months ago on tour and the guy's like, dude, this whole shop was inspired by your, I think your thing. And it's like, it's so weird to me. Like, um, you know, sometimes you don't always know like the effect that you have on people. And um, I still hear that, 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 that place, like, people who visited that place and gave them their own ideas to do stuff and combine things. And like, mm -hmm. you know, it's been cool to hear that. Yeah, for sure. We'll come back to the music in a second. Let's, let's hit on that because one thing, one reason I wanted to talk to you is about, uh, you know, from, again, from St. Louis, Missouri, just following you on social media and your music stuff all over the years, but talking about the shop, this entrepreneurial spirit. Right. And I mean, like you said, I, I was going to make the joke, like, what didn't you have at the shop? You had custom guitars, tattoos, motorcycles, I, the barbershop. I don't even, I don't even think I remember the barbershop piece, but was that also an opportunity to kind of, like you said, kind of like unplug from the matrix and, and being so consumed with music and then also express yourself and touch different parts of your creativity through the shop and through like that, that entrepreneurial spirit. Well, it was exactly that. So th it was a bit like, the matrix and i felt like if i'm gonna go the distance in music which i obviously have and mm -hmm. i'm still doing i i wanted to like i didn't want to get burnt so i knew i needed a, a, a just a breath from it and i had from living in la for all those years prior i met all these people that uh this guy richie the barber there there was a, bar a barber shop actually earlier on we ended up using that and we turned that section into something else I think it was, we turned that into the piercing area later on that transition. Um, but in the beginning there was a barbershop and there was a tattoo shop and my wife who I met on Melrose Avenue at a different shop, she was managing a different retail clothing store for years, a legendary shop. So there was like all this energy and we were living in like this super cool, um, it was a house, but it was like, Section big house. It was like sectioned off into like a fourplex, and there was a, a thing in the back with another. So it was five people, and it was everyone's like artists and tattoo artists and musicians, mm -hmm. and 
motorcycle and like to this whole like little community and it was just like let's just like do this and and see what happens you know because Melrose Ave even from the very early days of Silvertide when I would go and like that's where you would go it was like the Sunset Boulevard or the um you know the south street of of that area where you could just you could go and and shop and like experience new things and eat new food and like it was a culture it was a culture thing you know and it was culture shock to me seeing it for the first time, having gone to LA at 16, 17 to make the silver type stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming from Ben Sound, Pennsylvania, it's like I, you know, I didn't know from any of that. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it just there was a vibe, and I I wanted to try and see if I could kind of combine all my favorite things, put them under one roof, and what would happen. And it was successful, and it and it really did work. And for a number of years, that place was super fun. Um, ultimately there were two things that kind of pulled it apart. One was realizing that like we were in the business of managing kind of people who didn't want to be managed, Mm. you know, artists sometimes have their own way and kind of get into what they're into because they want to avoid rules. So, uh, which I totally respect because I'm one of them. (laughs) So it turned out that like managing like nine artists, like under one roof was like, extremely difficult and on top of that my wife got pregnant and i was feeling a call back towards um going out i got in a couple calls mm. to go out and play this show and this show mm-hmm. and this tour and this tour and um i was feeling a call and we realized if she was going to have a baby and i was going to go out and play shows like we something needed to give somewhere so we ended up closing the shop um but it was a cool moment in time man and i'm very proud of it and we did the shop was successful while we were open and we were making money and, and it could have gone on, I think for a lot longer. And, you know, I never say never, like the idea has occurred to me that it would be cool to open one day. Although this, the thing I would do differently is that I would be the, the boss. I wouldn't run the shop. So like mm-hmm. we were in the shop and running it, which was fun because we were with our friends, Yeah, but I couldn't do that again. But if, if we were going to like, I always thought it would be cool to do an East coast and a West coast one. Yeah. And to maybe in the future one day be a part of that and open it up and just hire really great people to manage it. You know what I mean? That would take care of like the day to day operations. So we'll see. Oh, that's awesome. Did uh so while you're in that period, because because again, my only connection that to you at that point was social media and I saw the shop and then I saw Walt was getting like a day job and I'm like, Oh, okay, well this happens, right? Like you know, music is taking a detour, life gets in the way, kinda like you're talking about. But from the shop and from that experience. Did that help prepare you for ultimately, which we'll get to a second, is when you started self-releasing your own music, be it Sun Via, now Terra Firma, in, in terms of being able to, um, like you said, like you didn't want any kind of creative controls that if you go through like the label process and you get signed and all that stuff, there's a lot of that stuff. Do you feel that the, the, the Perry and Cartel years helped fuel that kind of drive that vision for you musically? Well, there's one other big hurdle that came between that and this. And okay. that was, um, like I said, I did feel that kind of pull back. And when I turned 30 and I became a dad that same year, I really wanted to form my own band again. Because again, like I said, I was getting calls to do other things, but I didn't want to do other people's things. I want, if I was going to get back in, knowing how hard it is and how draining it can be and touring, it takes a lot of, you know, it's not just like a party 24 seven, the travel can be brutal. You sure. know what I mean, it's like, um, so if I was out there, I'm going to be doing it and flying all these places and doing all these things. Like I really wanted it ideally to be with my own music. And if I was going to leave my little girl, I really wanted it to be like worth it, you know? Um, so I started another band and that went through some evolving and some changing. And eventually it became a band called Mount Holly and we were signed. Um, and this time we signed, I signed an indie deal and I thought having come from this big major label situation, cause I was on a, big major label with Silvertide. But when I was out with Perry and some other artists, through them, I was also on and working with other labels as well, Columbia and some other big labels. And like, it was always a nightmare every time. So I was Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to do that. I'll do the indie label. I'll have more control. I'll have more of this. And it'll be hopefully smoother and blah, blah, blah. And it turns out I was so wrong. It was even worse. It was fucking worse. Oh no, man. It was awful. And, and, and the record, we made this really great record. Uh, it's called a pinch of 
Oh my God, I was going to say the Sinai. Thing. Sinai, yeah, Sinai. <laughs> a pinch of chaos. No, uh, the Mount Holly album is called Stride by Stride. It is on streaming services. It's a great record. I'm really proud of it. We cut the whole thing to tape. I'm really proud of the songs, um, the sounds, the tones, the, the arrangements, everything. I'm really, really proud of it. But uh, unfortunately, the stuff of the label went sideways and we handed in this, what I think is a really great record. And the label just shelved it for two years. And mm. it was like, it, it ruined the band because we were on tour and we were getting opportunities and going out. We, could, we did shows with Blackberry Smoke. We went over at Seas like two or three times because we were getting a little bit of a foothold in England. And we were going all these places and we didn't have any Track. music at all. Mm. Yeah. To, to sell, to show, to build upon. We had nothing. So it was just like, um, it, it, it destroyed the band. And and when I got out of that situation, um, I mean, we basically like broke up the band to, to, to just move on. Um, and when we got out of that, it was just like, I can't do it again. I cannot, if I'm going to continue, I can't, cause like, it's hard to explain to people who necessarily like aren't in that situation, but like, um, you're creatively handcuffed. Sure, you know, I, think, yeah. I, I mean, and and they own like my name, so I, I can't go do something else oh, either. Wow. So you're like, um, they don't own it, but like for that time, like I wasn't allowed to go make another record or do another thing and use my name. I'd have to use someone else's name. It was like, I don't, don't want to do that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The artist formerly known as Nick Perry, like. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> anyway, but I understand now. I like, really understand well that whole thing. So, um, so. Ultimately, all roads kind of led to two things. One was deciding that I was, if I was going to do it, I was going to really do it and like own my own masters and fund my own records and have 100% control. I knew I was going to be giving up some things because in life, there's always a push and a pull. Push pull. A pro yes, and a, yeah. So there's no like one thing that is just all great. You, there's a trade off with everything. But I felt like what I was going to be getting was going to be worth it worth the sacrifice of some other thing and the other thing was just through years and years and years of working with singers and i've always sung background vocals written uh melodies lyrics even did back to silver tide ain't coming home was my lyric um and um nothing to take away from walt i mean walt's the best the best singer and songwriter lyricist i've ever worked with and uh, will ever work with and he's the best and he, his contributions were phenomenal with that band but we did write a lot of stuff together and and um so it was just a matter of like if i wanted to do it and i wanted to step into that role which i was kind of avoiding for a lot of years because i just was having so much fun playing guitar and like not worrying about the other thing you know the other thing is a big responsibility and there's a lot of people and i understand it's it could be you know terrifying and like i did a tour last year where i was up on stage in my and i was a solo tour and so like i'm literally by myself with a mm. guitar and i'm like in and it was a, it was with white denim uh, which was a pretty big band and it was in california and it, i don't know how many people were in attendance but it was like probably 500 people at least and my voice just went out like in the middle of the show it just mm. it was too many shows in a row and i got to a certain point in the show and like the note didn't want to come out and then i was like <laughs> and like oh. someone in the front was really sweet and they ran and got me tea and it was and I, I limped through the end of the show, but like, it was terrifying. So it's like, this is a whole other world of things that like, I would understand why people don't want to do it. But ultimately, again, for me, um, I felt like if I was going to move forward, I had to really take um, responsibility and, and put myself in a position where I could, if I wanted to move forward, if I wanted to do a certain thing, say yes to a certain commitment, say yes to a certain thing where I could do that, and it not be a vote by committee. And I mean, not that there's anything wrong with democracy, right, not right, there's right. anything wrong with that. I've done, did it my whole life, but I got to a point where I was just like, I want to. You want your own shoes. You want to wear your own shoes. And if they, they run out, they run out, but they're your shoes, right? Amen. Well said. So <laughs> that, that's really what led to Sun Via. And, and that record you know, it gave me the confidence. Oh, my man. Boom, boom, boom. I got, I got, I got the color variants and I got that one, which coincidentally I'm a, it's going to be part of a giveaway when we release this on the podcast, but more to come there. That's so cool. Um, 
Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that record was big for me in so many ways. And, to, and when I put out Feeling Good, and it got the response that it did. I mean, arguably, Feeling Good is the most successful thing I've done since Silvertide. Like, that song, you know, it got on the radio charts. It didn't yeah. get to top 10, but it, it, it was played nationally. Uh, the song's done well on streaming and um, it's reached people, you know, and there's a lot of kids around the world who thousands who sent me uh, messages and videos of them playing guitar and learning the song. And it's like, I know it reached, it reached people. And um, I'm really grateful for that. Anytime that you can make any piece of art and it reaches somebody, even one person, if it's changes, you know, anybody and, and, uh, enables them to have an experience that's that's transformative in their own life it's like a beyond an honor so um to have that happen and and for it to be received the way it did dude it gave me the confidence that like okay i can do this it was worth the wait it was worth the struggle like i'm going to do this thing now and take my own life you know just take control of it take take control of my own life sure. which is something i never really felt like i had total control over especially when you're in you know, a five-way democracy that's a band. It's one of the reasons why Silvertide couldn't keep it together. You know, there was just, um, everyone wanted to do something else. And then in the end, we did nothing. Mm. You know what I mean? Because it was a true democracy where everyone had to vote. And then like, when you reach a stalemate, then it was, we did nothing. So we ended up just like literally doing nothing. Mm. We stopped stopped operating. Um, So at least this way, uh, for better or worse, you know, I, I keep the train on the tracks. And if people want to hop on, which I'm really grateful, like, you know, the people I play with um, in the Thieves are, are really great. Brian has been with me since Silvertide. He's a wonderful bass player. Zill was the drummer of a band called Pepper's Ghost in the Philly music scene who came up with Silvertide. And um, the two guys from that band, Pepper's Ghost, are now in a band called The War on Drugs, who oh, are doing yeah. very well. Yeah. So Pepper's Ghost was a launch pad for a bunch of stuff. And, and then Zill came into the Underground Thieves. Um, Justin is an incredible organ piano player. And um, Sunvia had six people. There was two brothers as well, called Michael and Anthony Montesano, who are brilliant songwriters and singers, friends of mine. They were in Pepper's Ghost as well. So it's like really a, a kind of a, um, a, an incestuous kind of circle there of <laughs> musicians in this, in this yeah, weird word to use. Um, no, 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 I'm with you. I to, I'm picking up what you're putting down, Nick. <laughs> uh, anyway, so... Um, the brothers aren't with me now and, and they did not contribute um, to Terraform outside of, we did write a couple songs together that are on that record, but they didn't perform on the record. They wanted to jump off and do their own thing, which is awesome. And I'm happy for them. And so, um, but leading to Terraform, like I was saying, it just, it gave me the confidence to go like, I can do this. And I maybe have something to say or contribute to this, to the, whatever, to the ether um, that is going to, mean something to someone you know what i mean for sure so um then it, then it then it was then it was kind of off to the races and and my ambition as you could tell with the, new <laughs> with the double album yeah just a little bit sure <laughs> it took it took over and like that it's so funny it's it's like people who know me it's probably not a surprise at all that like given full control now and like totally the ability and confidence and all the things to do what I want. Like, oh yeah, of course he's going to do a double album. Concept <laughs> album. Like, it's very Nick Perry to do that. I was what I'm sure they're all thinking. Um, and I guess it is, you know, I, I guess, I guess it is. So I, I've always loved kind of um, bigger production things. And I grew up doing theater and I, I love like, I mean, I mean, even from the time I was young, like Tommy by the who, mm. and of course the wall, the wall's my all time favorite studio record of all time uh i just love like these kind of deeper concept things where you like get it's more than just like a handful of songs it's like you get into like the thing you sure. know and there's a yeah. story and there's an arc and there's a purpose and there's a message and i love stuff like that um well before we get to the main event of terra firma i want to ask you a couple real quick hitters um sure. talking about switching to singing you, you touched on earlier because you know again playing guitar it's what you knew what you're really good at like how how daunting was that too? Because you said you were involved in lyric writing and, and, and background vocals and stuff, but you know, finding your vo- voice, so to speak, was was that uh, was that equal parts scary but also exciting? Yes, and and for many years, like over the years, I I I was writing songs and and singing a lot 
over the years privately and just for my own enjoyment or just to kind of test the waters and see what my voice was doing because the human voice changes. And so to be honest with you, I just, I didn't really care for the sound of my voice. I mean, I've come to learn that many singers don't care for the sound of their voice. In fact, many people just in general don't even like the sound of their voice when they right hear here, that. Right here, buddy. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's some weird thing in the brain. I don't know what it is, you know, it's, um, but either way, like I do feel like over the years, my voice changed and it got to a place where, you know, five or six years ago, I wrote a song, um, and I sang it and I did a demo of it and I listened back and it was the first time that I was like, I didn't like love it, but I like, I didn't hate it. Okay. And I was like, I was like, okay, I actually, I like the way that the song sounds. I like the way that my voice sounds in this song and the tone of my voice in this music. And then I wrote a bunch of songs that I didn't like. And I was like, okay, well, what made this special that I sure. liked it for this? So then like it was trial and error, you know, like um, trying to figure out what made that one palatable for me and not other ones. And then I was just lucky that I had a string of songs that came to me that I really started to dig. And Feeling Good was one of them. Yeah. Let You Know was one of them. They all came quick. Feeling Good, Let You Know, Fall um excess um uh, all came within like a really short amount of time hmm. oh and I, I want you uh one of my favorites on the album i'm glad you said that because i was curious where that one came from i love that song yes. and you know that's one of those songs and i still play it every night um i mean i, I still play a number of those songs every night but but i want you i i just can't see getting tired of that one i no. every once in a while i get a little tired of other things but i want you is just so much fun to sing and to play and um when I got that song and all those songs, like we're talking like just a few months, all those songs um, in my bedroom and writing in my studio and just like it, they all, they all happened. And I was like, Oh man, I got it. I got the thing now, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I combined that with a couple other things that my bandmates were working on and um, a couple collaborative things. And then that was the record. You know what I mean? It, it was, it was there. Once I had like enough of those tunes, I was like, yeah, I got it. I got the record. Mm -hmm. So um, it, I, again, it gave me the confidence. And then I kind of never looked back, to be honest. I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And then, um, and it's the same way now, like I, I'll, I'll write songs and not every song I write, I keep because I am, I don't think any songwriter does that. You know, you, you write a song uh, for me, like I, I'll write the song and I'll, not judge it while I'm writing it. I'll get it out for what it is without labeling it yet. But then I'll go back and listen back to it and to go, trip. okay, yeah, I like this. I don't like this. This fits. It doesn't fit. Um, but then I just started getting enough of ones that I liked that, you know, it, it led me to believe that I had, again, something worthwhile to um, to put out. Right on. So then... And, and, and this goes for Sun Bia too. And, and I can just say this is following you on socials. Vinyl. Is, is super important to your your artistic output, right? And you kind of hit on before some of your influences, Pink Floyd. I know you're big into Neil Young, example. Um, how important was it for you as you're putting this music out in the world to make sure that there's a vinyl representation of it? And I say that because because even Sun Via was right before the official vinyl renaissance, if you will, that's kind of going on now. Um, was it, in, was it kind of something that was, it had to be deliberate, right? Because I'm sure you could put out a CD, you can put out the digital version, but to make a conscious choice to make sure that Sunvia and now Terra Firma on vinyl, what was your thought process there? It's a great question. To be honest with you, man, and we're, I think, about the same age, right? So okay. um, when I was a teenager, uh, I mean, you're talking like the heyday of CD and Nobody in a million years thought we'd ever, ever, ever go back to vinyl. That's right. And <laughs> when I was a teenager, and I know because there was a place, uh, the Princeton Record Exchange, which oh, is not far, yeah. From, yeah, not far from Philly, uh, but it's so open. And um, and I used to go up there. There was there was a shop in Philly on South Street. Um, there there were a couple places locally, um, but you could get literally anything for under five dollars, like awesome. literally anything. And I'm pretty sure it's, I mean, so I've got hundreds of records up here. This is my studio. It's my sanctuary. Huh. It's where I listen to music. It's where I write music. It's the whole third floor of a, of a house. And I've got hundreds of vinyls that are just beyond this camera. 
um, and many of them have are my originals from when I was a teenager, and they still have the price tag. And I think Tommy by The Who, which is like a classic album, double record, concept record. I'm pretty sure it, it says like four dollars on it. Mm. You know what I mean? And now for an original first press, and we're talking original pressing. Nice. Okay? We're not talking. Nice. We're not talking reissues. Attaboy. There were no reissues. No one was reissuing them. That's right. <laughs> no one wanted them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So like the, we're talking original pristine first edition thing I'm getting for under five dollars. It was like talk about a heyday. That was the heyday. The golden so, era. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I was buying them up. And I've always loved vinyl. And to be honest with you, it was because eventually on CD, I think Tascam or someone eventually invented this thing where you could you could slow a CD down for guitar players and you could like learn things slower. But that came later when I was first learning music and guitar. There was no YouTube. You couldn't slow anything down, you, but I could on my turntable. Mm, sure. You know what I mean? And it was easier to lift the needle and go back. Let me hear it again. Let me hear it again. Let me hear it again. I mean, obviously, when you slow stuff down on a turntable, you're affecting the pitch. So that's not easy to learn there either. But if you wanted to listen to what the sequence of notes was at a slower uh, slower speed, you could. So for uh, like ACDC and Guns N' Roses and stuff, like it was really helpful to be able to slow stuff down and listen to what the phrasing is at least, then put it back, then you're in pitch, and you could move it back and keep moving it back to hit the same spot. You know, That was a big thing for me. So... Um, it was always about vinyl. Awesome. And it still is always about vinyl. But through the, you know, the years and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it definitely, like when we did Silver Tide, it was not a thing that was in vogue. Nobody cared about it. It wasn't even an option to press sun mm. or to press show and tell on vinyl. It wasn't even an option mm. in 2004. There was no, it wasn't presented to us. It wasn't a thing that was talked about. It was just like, you know, I knew I had my little vinyl collection that like no one else cared about. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's the way I was though. And, and you know, right? So it's yeah. like, uh, fast forward and uh, I'm living in LA and like, I mean, I guess Amoeba played a role in oh, that yeah. area. Old Amoeba, okay? yeah. No bowling alley, yeah. Yeah. So there was a vibe around that. And I feel like people started uh having the experience again of like going to a store and like having the tactile thing and i was a part of it and yeah and then and but still even in that moment you could get anything pretty cheap um prices now are absurd (laughs) preach preach nick preach (laughs) yeah they're well same thing with with the vintage guitar market like it's it's just gotten to a place where it's just like it's it's stupid and i'll be the first one i just it's, it's so stupid and um, it's unfortunate because it places a lot of great things out of reach for the average person. For sure, for sure. Um, but you know, it is what it is. And um, you know, I was at um, ooh, what did I buy? So I have a local record store here. Where oh, is yeah. It? I, oh yeah. I, I just bought this, which is a first pressing from 1970. Um, Look at that, Poco. So this Love is it. Timothy B. Schmidt, who went on to play in the Eagles. Yep, yep. Uh, this record has uh, You Better Think Twice, which is um, just my probably the best Poco song, in my opinion. But this is an original pressing, and um, it wasn't cheap, but like <laughs> when I find things like this, I, I have to have Cannot it. Cannot pass. So, That's right. Yep. So uh, to answer your question with a long-winded answer, no, um, love it, love it. when I got in control again, because I really wanted to do... So I started getting into... I mean, the other side of this is production. So I learned how to produce an engineer and, and like make records just through doing it over the years. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, other bandmates of mine could give two shits, but I was like the one like trying to learn how the tape machine worked. And so if you're into like the production side of stuff and the, the audio quality and the signal chain and for guitar and tone and all this stuff like if you're into all that stuff it only makes sense to like see it actualized in the final thing you know and everybody knows that like you know to go through all that time and energy and money and like to go and to and mix and to record on tape mm-hmm. which is like expensive and and right. and in this moment in time like some people think it's silly but i love it i love the experience of it like to do all that and then like listen to an mp3 it's like i know i know it doesn't yeah. make sense so it's like to be, oh, it has to be actualized onto vinyl it has to be because it's there's no better way to experience the 
three D ness of yep. the of the music, right? One hundred. So I mean, it's it's not even debatable. Everyone knows this. So um, when I did Sun Via, there was the very first thing was vinyl. In fact, it was vinyl over anything else first. It was like I had to make the vinyl, have enough money to make the vinyl. Then I'll worry about CDs and and T shirts and whatever. Now we're into this new thing. Which is so rad because again, it's it's from my generation, but like cassettes are coming back. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. And um, and so I have all my old tapes. So look at this. So like, <laughs> these are these are original. Um, I mean, dude, dude, look at this. Okay, this is. I mean, this is like from when. Oh yeah, dude, right from our era. Yes. <laughs> this is a real talk about STP. This is a killer soundtrack. Everyone mm-hmm. who knows knows. Nirvana, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Vitology. Oh, yeah. Damn. I mean, yeah, dude. Speaking my love so, language right there. So this is like all my stuff, and um, and dude, check this out. So this is double cassette. So this is how I got the oh, idea wow. for the double What's cassette. That? Woodstock like ninety four. Yeah, ninety four. Bu- butterfly case. <laughs> double cassette. Yeah. Okay. So when I wanted to do terra firma, and this was like a thing that I thought would actually. I wouldn't lose my ass on making this stuff because it's not cheap to like gear up to do this stuff. For sure. So here's the terra firma double cassette butterfly case. Oh dude. Nice work. And just to do it and to like, to have the thing was mega for me, you know? That's so right. Um, so I've, I've kind of always been in this world. I have a tape player. That's a part of my rack here for years. Um, and uh, to see it coming around is also cool. I mean, it's it's an analog experience on the go, mm-hmm. um, which is cool. People who are like listening to Walkmans, which is like so unbelievable that it's a thing. <laughs> but it's it's so cool, and it's I'm all about it. Like I'm all about the analog experience. And again, like tactile, being able to hold it. Like it is so much more fun to go out for because I I like to bike ride. It's so much more fun to go out and have like be able to take something physical with you, mm-hmm. and and then it is to like you know set a playlist out. up on your phone or any of that yeah right. but in all fairness and, and it, has a place, still, has a place. it has a place and i do listen to spotify i do listen to apple music oh, sure. it's super convenient i can find things if i want to send someone a song it's so easy but i want to have both and i think that's the answer of our time and place now is uh having our cake and eat it too you know i mean the digital experience has a role it's super convenient it's easy and it, it allows you to like listen to things like if you have an idea, like what was that? You can go look it up. You can go play it. You can go share it. It's great. Mm-hmm. But it also would be sad to me to live in the world without the real physical experience of opening a record, smelling it, cleaning it, the ritual. Okay. Yeah, sure, I have my yes, clean sure. solution over there and, and my right. and my um, brush. And it's, you know, like when I put on a record, it's like a ritual it's an intentional experience, right? Not just the listening part, but preparation, right. For doing it yeah. all the way. I'm, I'm going to listen to this. Like I haven't even listened to this yet. It's, it's brand new uh, to me. So it's like, I haven't had the night yet where I'm going to do this, but awesome. I know that right. mm-hmm. coming up, I'm going to take it out. I'm going to clean it. If there's any static dust on it or whatever, which I don't think there is this guy's super clean that I buy from, but um, I'll maybe clean it anyway. And I'm going to put it on <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to sit and listen to this and have an experience, you know, and it's like you said, intentional, which is super cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's not just one thing to put it on the turntable, but the preparation to set the time aside to really be one with the music. I mean, sometimes it's easy to maybe like, you know, do something else while you're listening, but then you're not really present for the experience and you're kind of shortchanging what you're there for. Right. So, all right, let's main event time, terra firma. You kind of, you kind of, you kind of let off with talking about to put all the work into making it and putting it on tape and then to bring it to the finish line and not see it all the way. That's one thing I want to talk because you had Steve Filoni, if I'm pronouncing it right from Sterling involved in the mastering, right. And he knows what he's doing. I mean, he's like a two time Grammy winner and like legit, legit. Right. So, so no, I don't want to use the expression, no expenses spared because obviously you put this all out on your own and you know, you, Famously, you did this, I think, even for Sun Vias, is that you were fun, you were fundraising, like selling off some gear, some guitars, all that stuff. So a true labor. Yeah, we even product. did. Yeah, we even did auction stuff for to get to help with this one. You know, we auctioned off stuff. So, so Terra Firma is it safe to? So, first of all, it translates to firm land, right? Did I, did I have that right? Yeah, yeah, earth, soil, land. Okay. I mean, it is, it is that, it is of the earth. 
and I've seen I've seen other uh, conversations about the album before it comes out here, talking about like this is the album you feel like you were meant to make. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Sure. And just to go back, um, I've heard it pronounced a few different ways. I think it is Falone though, like Stallone. Falone. Okay. Stallone. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, no. I, I defer to you, my Italian friend. I defer to you. <laughs> no, no, no. I just do it because I thought the same thing. It could go either way. Um, Steve Falone, Sterling Stone, and he did master Sun Via. And he did such a great job because that record, and I think it is important to note because Sun Via was made over a really long time where there were sessions in like, I think seven different studios across the country. Oh, wow. Because I was also on tour and doing sideman work with an artist named Dorothy. And yeah, I was that, using that. was that the last money. time I saw you. It came through St. Louis and you were playing a gig. And you probably don't remember this, but she was playing. And during one of the songs, I just yelled out, Nick Perry. And you kind of had a weird look on her face because like, who, who's going to be yelling for the guitar player at the Dorothy show? This guy, that's who. But anyway. Well, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I had a great fun on that tour and I got to really be me and kind of do my thing and within her. Uh, I really love that uh, experience. Um, but that helped fund the recording of Sun Via. So um, Steve did uh, the hardest job in the world, which is he had to make seven different recording situations over 10 songs with three different mixers. He had to make it sound like one album oh, and he did sure. the best job in the world. Um, he gave it what I like to call like this beautiful, like analog warm goo that just like is over the whole, it's like a, it's a sheen and a polish, but it's a warm polish. You know what I mean? Makes sense. And, and um, that's how I like to, if you were, if you were to hear like the mixes before that, that's exactly what it is. Like, like a warm honey. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're getting into audiophile uh, terms here. So love it. Um, so anyway, so um it was really important to me with Terra Firma and the reason why we fundraised and we did a whole bunch of stuff because it was going to be expensive. I wanted to do the whole thing in one studio at one time with the same sound. I didn't want 10 different snare drums and it's a different technique. Some people who are making records, they want a different snare drum sound for each song and God bless them. That's a cool thing. But for me, it was like, I wanted the record to have one sound. So my guitar uh, from you know 90% of the album 95% it sounds the same from track 1 to track 10 the only change is I did play a telly on two songs or or at least one if not two songs so that has a slight tonality change but it's the same amps the same settings the same thing same drum kit same snare drum same bass tone like I wanted it to be the same sonic footprint for every song just what changes is obviously the music and the instrumentation some songs have instruments in different places but it's the same basic sound i wanted it to have one cohesive sound sure and to do that like all most of my favorite records are that way you know when you put on dark side of the moon it's the same sound through one through however many nine songs are on that record so um to do that and and we knew it was going to be expensive and i wanted just to go all the way i because dude we're talking about coming out of the pandemic i had people that i knew that passed away, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it was like a time where everyone's going like, dude, tomorrow is not guaranteed. So like, I have this vision that I wanted to do this big record and I had the concept for it. And I, and I had the songs and like the actual title track was written in 2013. So that's oh, wow. 10 years old. Been sitting yeah, on I've been okay. sitting on it for a while. And there's a couple songs I've been sitting on, but that one's the longest. Um, and so it was just time to like, do all the things like I wanted to have a real cello. I wanted to have a quartet of strings on a number of songs, which we did. And I wanted to, you know, I wanted to record the whole fucking thing on tape and I wanted to record everything on tape and, uh, which cost time and uh, money and the whole thing is, but I wanted to do it for no, it right. for nobody else. I wanted to do it for me. And you're doing it for the right reasons, my friend. I mean, if it, you know, it's like we talk about, like you know, my goofy YouTube channel and all these things. Any kind of creative endeavor, as long as you are entertaining or fulfilling yourself, it can't be nothing but a success. If that for that alone, right? Totally, yeah. If it doesn't matter what the what the response is, I mean, of course, I'm hoping that it's well received and people like it. But ultimately, I think it is a success in that it was created and created the way I wanted it to be. And um, so I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of the fact that it was not easy to pull off as an independent artist with, you know, if at the start, you know, no budget, like how are we going to pull off a double album? It's like, it's hard enough to pull off a single <laughs> album. Like, yes, sir. Yeah. How are you going to pull off a double? But I, I rallied 
and I had a lot of support and a lot of help. Um, and like I said, we auctioned off things that we didn't think we were going to need for this record. I was selling things I didn't think, you know, if I didn't need to take it into the studio to make the record, I thought, I don't need it. I'm only taking in what I need. So anything else, I'll just sell it, help fund the record. And one day I'll buy back if I need it. If I don't, then sayonara. So a very minimalist yeah. approach, right? Like like whatever's not bolted down that we need to make. Dude, and totally. And this is part of the concept as well, just realizing that, and it's a really tough pill to swallow. It's, for me, it's been as I get older and try to accept the fact that um, nothing in this life is permanent. We can't take this stuff with us anyway. Like, it's cool that I have this cassette, but if I didn't have this cassette, I'd be fine. You know what I mean? Like, right, yes. and that, that's a very small item compared to some of the big life things I'm talking about on the record. But it, it, the, the concept is the same. Like, everything in our life is temporary and we can't take with us and we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So, like, ultimately, the really important stuff is like enjoying the present, enjoying the people that we have while we have them. Mm -hmm. We just don't know what tomorrow will bring. As cliche as that sounds, like it's totally true. And everyone knows who's experienced life that things happen that are unforeseen and, and it's a part of our existence. And, you know, there's a song on the record called Exist that talks about that. There's many songs on the record that talk about this concept of, of, of life and death. And, and um, so really like, me doing the record was actually fulfilling it. It's like I'm practicing what I'm preaching. I mm. couldn't I couldn't be talking about this and then be like, you know, uh, living a certain way. Like I'm living this. Uh, you know, for me to be to sing any of this and to even write these lyrics, like it had to be authentic. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's no way that it, it. I couldn't have even faked it if I wanted to. Like they wouldn't have come. Like it all came from a real place because this is what I'm going through in life right now. You know what I mean? Is it safe to say that a lot of this? I mean, obviously you're still with us, thankfully, but is it uh, autobiographical in, in some parts in, in, when you're kind of composing some of the songs, like in terms of the influence and the, and the inspiration for some of the tracks? Yes, most of the time I am, if it's not directly autobiographical, it is me trying to convey a emotion that I felt in a, in a way that could be digested and understood. And I, I've thought about this and I've, done some interviews recently where this is subject has come up and it's um i don't know where my writing will go and what my style will evolve into because everyone does change over time and and um and evolve the way we do as humans but um for now at least i feel like my little tiny niche lyrically at least is like taking really complex and like heavy and deep emotions that are that are because because emotions are complex to begin with and and how we feel them and express them but um certainly there are there are other emotions as we as we get older and go through life that are like really complex but it's mm -hmm. um how can i how can i talk about them and 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 boil them down to something that's super simple and and can like cut through all the bullshit and just like say what it is or i'm not trying to be overly poetic is what i'm no. saying I'm trying. Uh, I'm trying to just to be as direct as possible and like go to the core of the thing without beating around the bush. And I'm not saying that people who are poetic in their lyrics are beating around the bush. There's a place for beautiful poetry, of course. But my style, at least at the moment, is kind of just like saying the thing that I that I mean. Um, so when I, you know, say certain things like in exist and like, um, you know, th it's this moment in time. As long as we exist together, mm -hmm. you know, like and make the most out of this moment. Like it's literal, it's literal. Well, and that's and what that's, I thought, well, that's what I thought too, because like I told you before we came on air is that it finally hit me. I've listened to it about five times. You're kind enough to give me an advanced listen. And I was on a run this morning and it hit me once I hit terra firma, which is right at that hinge point. It's the seventh track and it hit me. And I was like, I think that this, there's a, there's a shift going on. And as you kind of talked about the life and death piece, and, and then you go into the, the eighth track, which is morning light which if you think about it, like mornings, it's like a new birth, right? It's like a new start, right? So so definitely can feel the, the and, and I thought this before, is like the Floyd vibes of talking about a concept and taking it from start to finish. Like, I don't think you could have done this without doing a double album because you're literally going from one part of the spectrum to the other part. And so it took me a minute, took me a minute to be honest with you, because I'm, well, I'm into the tasty riffs and I'm into the lyrics and I'm all that stuff. But then all of a sudden it hit me this morning. I'm like, I think I'm picking up what he's putting down here. 
Well, I'm going to give you bonus points because you really, it just dawned on me. I'm thinking this whole time that like, that, that you had some of the text and like some of the things. So like you, you, you deciphered from just, it was what a SoundCloud? SoundCloud. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> so you deciphered it. Uh, I mean, it is, it is a, it's a bona fide double album where each album has a different name. When people open this, Terra Firm is the name of the record of the album, but when they open each, each half, each album of the two has a different title within that mm. and different songs underneath. And one is Death After Life and one is Life After Death. Crack the like, code, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You cracked the code, man, without, without any training, uh, without any uh, instruction manual. So I'm really, I'm really proud of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's so cool. Yeah, you, yeah, you know that. And Terra Firm is the last song on the first. That makes complete sense because then, because then once I quote unquote cracked the code, then I went back and listened to the first part again, and I'm like, oh yeah, there's there's like there's there's a path going on here. Until then, it hit like I said, and using the wrong word, the hinge point. And then I feel is it safe to say that that the second album is the life part because that yeah. I felt like there was more spirit and like again starting with morning light it felt like a like a phoenix almost kind of scenario yeah morning light i want to be free which is probably the most upbeat song on the record and come to me you know i i do feel like it ends on an important note as kind of uh well i don't know what to <laughs> it's hard it's uh, hard and that's why i wasn't going to ask about it yeah <laughs> but yeah so so um but yeah i think i think you're on track man I think awesome. that's right. no. The record was is I've, I've I've been saying this because what's what's interesting is I've already started album three, <laughs> and uh, yes. I'm I'm not allowing myself to go fully into it until this one is out because like it's the same thing happened with Sunvia like as soon as Sunvia was physically off my shoulders and into the universe it was like such a huge relief that I was able to really then start to channel the music that would be making up Terra Firma. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the same thing's going to happen. Like as soon as, like basically July first, I'm going to be like, "All right, shed the go. skin, shed the skin." Yeah, <laughs> I'm ready because I've I'm just I haven't like actively tried to write anything, but I'm not turning it off either if something organically comes. So um, either way, what I'm getting at is I, I have an idea for what album three is, and it's different than anything that we've heard yet, but. It, the reason I'm bringing this up is like I could not physically have written about, sung about, performed different music or songs than what is on this. There's no way to have written anything else. Like this had to be said. It had to. It had. I had to do it. It's time has do, come. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And there was nothing else. Like uh, I don't know who I was talking to. Uh, someone in passing said something about like, oh, I hope there's another feeling good on there. And I was like. Ugh. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't i don't want to do that like no, 100 it's, it's like you said it's the evolution of not just your voice your songwriting your your journey right like it, yeah, and it, I love it's a nice song good. right i love feeling good but like the thought of of doing feeling good part two sounds like so disinteresting like all my favorite artists they push themselves they they evolve and they're constantly growing and like the idea of going backwards just sounds like counterproductive to me you know what i mean so oh. I'm, I'm with you. Like I used to do, not, not to take this about me for a second, but I used to do marathons, road races, all this kind of stuff. And it kind of what you're talking about is like, after I did it, like, why, why do it again? You know, unless I wanted to improve my PR or something like that. So one, once I've got it out, I'm ready on to the next. I'm doing adventure races. I'm doing whatever. Right. So I can completely empathize with like, it's okay to look back. And so I appreciate yeah. the past, but sure. you, can't, you, you can't go forward if you're holding on to the past. Right. Very well said, man. <laughs> well, cool. Well, hey, uh, we're running up on time here, but I wanted to hit a couple of quick hitters before we get you out the door. Um, obviously, is the next step for this album, hopefully a tour, hopefully coming to St. Louis? I don't know. We'll see. All right. We'll see. Awesome. We are, we are um, like, this is such a big endeavor to get this double album with, I mean, there's twice as many singles, twice as many music videos. For sure. For sure. It's, it's literally twice of everything. Um, so like the actual like runway of this thing, I can just imagine like a, a plane that's twice as big as the normal plane. Like it needs more time. It needs more gas. It needs more to think, to do its thing. Like that's what this experience has been like. And I kind of thought it would be, and I'm pretty right. So I just, it's taking more time, but I'm all sure. those other, all those other things will come. Yeah. Right on. Um, all right. The last, this is kind of a fun one. So where you are now, what would your advice be to Silvertide Nick? If you could go back, oh if, if there was if there was one thing you could impart on him, 
knowing what you know now and where you've been, is there is there like one thing you'd be like, hey man, check this out? Probably just to slow down. <laughs> slow down and just like try to enjoy and soak it up a little bit. Not that I didn't enjoy or I didn't soak it up, but I would just been like, dude, just try to be a little bit more present. You know, it's it's all gonna it's all gonna be okay. Um instead of having my mind like 50 feet in front of, you know, the step I was taking then. Um, and that's, again, not to say I didn't enjoy some of it in, in full presence, but um, I could have enjoyed more. I think the temptation is when we're young, we think that everything is A, going to stay the same and be the same forever and nothing's going to change. We don't have the concept of how life works yet. You know what I mean? And unless we've had some sort of traumatic event, which does happen to some people at a young age, mm -hmm. that kind of like instills in you young that like no you can't take this for granted like unless that is present and it wasn't for me at that point in my story yet um, i had no concept of the way that the le you know life really works so like i was kind of i was kind of taking stuff for granted i mean then again if you're 17 and like touring japan and like <laughs> you know on tour with aris and it's like how could you kind of not take it for granted of course, I mean, of course. a 17 year old doesn't have the life skills to, to do probably more than what he or she's doing uh, at best. But if I could time travel or like Bill and Ted or, <laughs> or, or Marty McFly, yep. um, I would just be like, yo, dude, just slow down a little bit and just try to soak up each one of these experiences a little bit more because none of them last forever. You know, as yep. cliche as it is, you know, nothing gold ever stays, but it's true. That's true. Well, Nick, a real treat, a real pleasure. I appreciate you doing this with me. Like I said, I've been, been trying to connect with you ever since I saw that first show in 2004. Um, well, I will Thanks say for the many years of support. I really appreciate <laughs> it. Well, it's, you know, it's again, it's like social media. You can always keep track on people where they're going. Right. But um, I will say, I think it's a testament to what, hopefully where the album goes terra firma because you've sold out of all the physical copies, vinyl for first run, first pressing. And, and you're very clear in the website, first pressing, letting people know first pressing you had the double, the, uh, the cassette, the CD, uh, the T-shirts. I think I think everything associated with this product, it's gone. it's gone. And I think that's a testament to people are hungry and we're ready for this album. And again, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to sample it and get my get my finger licking good going on beforehand. So Nick, thank you for the time. And I really appreciate it, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And uh, keep up the good work over there, man. Count on it. And that was another trip around the turntable. Thanks for listening to Vinyl Community Podcasts.